Hey everyone, it's Casey McEwen back again with another video today. Today's gonna be a little bit different though. I actually have a good friend and fellow investor here. Denver, how's it going? Hey everybody, it's going really good. Just ready to talk some real estate today. Absolutely, appreciate uh, having him come out. We're just gonna ask some questions here today with him. Kind of give an idea of you know what he's been able to do in my local market. We did meet about four years ago and he's had a good role of success in real estate. So first things first, just give us a quick uh, synopsis of What's been going on with you? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm actually from the DFW area, uh, born and raised here, went to the Marine Corps at 18, and that's kind of where we developed our bond is we were both Marines. Um, left the Marine Corps around 23, 24, um, took some corporate jobs, and I started to get into corporate, or excuse me, real estate, just investing in, in general. Um, I went to go down that financial independence path, and I found that that was a better option for me, and that I learned that through bigger pockets. Um, of course, that's, that's where the two of us met. So give me, give me. Uh, I know I started off a ton on bigger pockets. Give me, give me your overall opinion on bigger pockets. I think it's a fantastic platform that is free if you have Spotify. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a free platform where you can just learn about how people have already done what you know what we're currently doing now. Um, it's not rock and science. It's not reinventing the wheel. It's just a platform that allows us to just see literal examples out there and learn from that. Um, and I took a lot of examples just from podcasts reading some of the forms online and some of the books. Um, and of course, that's where the, the forms is where you and I met as far as connecting about now I want to begin this journey in the DFW market. Yeah, so for folks that haven't checked it out, this is just a huge shout out to Bigger Pockets. Actually, where we're filming this uh, is the good friend of mine, Tyler, the owner of NXT Mortgage, which is a local mortgage company here in Dallas, Texas. We actually met and have become best friends from Bigger Pockets. It's been a great place for me to network with other like-minded individuals, such as Denver here as well. And with Denver, we met off Bigger Pockets. What was the uh, what was the first thing that we started getting into after we met at Bigger Pockets? Uh, well, I think I think we first started talking about my interest in looking for a duplex. I wanted to really follow the the multifamily path. Um, I think you started to line me up because I'd already been working with one agent that just wasn't really investor friendly, um, was more looking to sell somebody on their next, you know, home forever. Um, and we connected just because I've already seen on the post that, you know, you already understand rental properties, you have a few of your own, and then you're marketing toward those veterans in the area. Um, and I felt comfortable working with you. Um, so I think probably two or three weeks after we first connected online is when we met in person, we started looking at actual duplexes when I was ready to go in the market. Um, and like you mentioned with Tyler, you know, you lined me up with him, another veteran in the, in the same industry. Um, and he worked pretty, pretty quick and diligently to get me pre-approved and get me set up and, and rolling. Yeah. So in terms of that first deal, now most people they're trying to, and this is actually the route that I think I initially went with you on, at least that I can recall about four years ago, three and a half, four years ago. I think initially we were looking potentially for a property for yourself, but what was that first property we wound up finding? Yeah. So uh, first property, and, and I was looking to house hack my first property. Um, I think when we were looking around, there just wasn't the right property because I wanted something a little bit more upscale and living in the Dallas area. I felt very comfortable in that that environment and we just couldn't find that one immediately. Um, however, I did have the capital um, saved up for my first investment property that was 25% down payment, not owner occupied. Um, so I didn't live in the first one, but the first deal uh, we found, I believe off Zillow, it just randomly popped up and that I think they, they listed it wrong as well. We caught them. Um, and I believe it was a, a, it's a, it's a duplex, two bed, one bath, both sites, um, listed for 205. Luckily we had it appraised at 264. So immediate equity there, nearly $60,000. Um, and it's over in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas. And it's, it's a growing area that's been around for quite a long time and it's going through its own changes as far as improving in the right direction. Um, but it, it quickly, um, we got it under contract pretty quickly and it, I think I did maybe two or three grand worth of renovation work. I mean, it was turnkey as, as it really comes. Um, and like I said, that was that was the first real avenue, but it wasn't an owner-occupied house hack. Um, so it wasn't the strategy we wanted to start with, but it was the one that came to me with the best opportunity for the best return. Yeah, so for most people, obviously every single market's going to differ, but if you're familiar with the Dallas market, $200,000 for a duplex or $100,000 a door is very, very cheap. I would say almost that's... That's not attainable in our market anymore. Now, this actual duplex, as Ian mentioned, it was listed incorrectly. So a lot of agents, if they aren't experienced, they'll list a full duplex as a half duplex, which most people, when they're searching for duplexes, they're searching for multifamilies. Well, a half duplex is indeed not a multifamily 
property. So you actually were the person that brought it up because it didn't fit in the criteria search that I was sending you. You said, hey, is this an actual full duplex? We went out, took a look. It was a actual owner sitting there doing all the work himself. Okay, so if any issues that we did have, he would directly fix them himself. We then found out it was a full duplex. We're able to get it under contract. And like you said, tremendous equity from day one. Yeah. Yeah. And I really couldn't ask for a better deal. Um, and, and I believe we closed on that in uh, summer of 2018. Uh, so I've been in the game for about three years. Um, and, and luckily since then, it's been a fantastic cash flowing property. Um, many people probably know the 1% rule, which is really tough to get now in the Dallas market. Um, like, like you said, we, you know, close at 205 and appraise at 264. It's probably worth a little bit more than that right now. Uh, but rents are bringing in at just over 2,300 a month and it is consistently renting out. People like it. Um, so it's been a cash flow machine. So give me just for the viewers here, give me an idea of what your, if you can recall off the top of your head, what's your mortgage payment? And you said it brings in about $2,300 a month, correct? Yeah, it brings in $2,300 a month. Uh, initial mortgage payment, I believe, was twelve forty, dollars um, And I dropped that down. I, I refinanced here with uh, with Tyler and NXT Mortgage. I dropped that down to just over $1,100. And I did that through the COVID refinance process. Is, uh, of course, getting a cheaper interest rate. Um, property management on that right now is $79 a door, which is really important for me as, as a passive investor. I don't want to be so involved. Um, for the last five years, I've had a pretty hectic corporate job and I just didn't have the time to manage both properties and my actual W2 job. Um, but it, it, I would say all in all, probably looking at about 900 straight cash flow a month on top of the mortgage payment. And that's on top of any other expenses, including property management. So have you had owning it for just about three years? Have you had and this is again having bought the property with it fully, almost fully remodeled. What uh, you said you spent about two or three thousand dollars. Is that two or three thousand dollars you've spent since you've owned it, or how much? How much expenses over the last three years have you had? Yeah, great question. Um, I would probably say the two thousand dollars, two or three thousand upfront was literally just cleanup work. Um, you know, installing some little vanities and mirrors, and nothing, nothing too crazy. Some initial contractor repairs and stuff. Um, since owning that over about three years, I've probably spent another. Three thousand dollars, very minimal things. Um, we're talking like you know, cutting down large trees that were hanging over the house. Um, you know, small roof leak, and I believe um, the the electric gate just had a, had an issue, right? Noth nothing too crazy, and and luckily um, through bigger pockets and you know what we've talked about. Like I, I budgeted initially before going to, into buying this rental property for ten percent for vacancy, ten percent for repairs, ten percent for capex, and I've never touched those budgets at all. Um, so luckily, it's it's been a very sturdy property, and um, over the last three years. I've had one tenant on one side for the entire length of that term, and then one tenant had moved out, and I got it rented back out within two weeks. So you're, you're looking north of $10,000 a year in cash flow, and you're spending what looks to be about 1000 So, I mean, you're still profiting 90% after your expenses and, and what would otherwise be the rest of your expenses as well, which is... Pretty good for a, a first-time investment. So give me a little idea, though. I know I personally helped him purchase that property, and we've been continuing to do so as well. Tell us a little bit about your second property and how that worked out. Yeah, so second property was a, was a very fun and interesting property. Uh, we actually put the offer in on that property the day that we were closing on the last property that we just discussed. Um, so very back to back. But um, what happened is I, I was, of course, like any other real estate investor, just scrolling through MLS, uh, the emails that I'm getting from you, Redfin. And I actually caught on the last day of a vacation in Cancun, um, this property in Knox Henderson, part of Dallas, uh, very upscale neighborhood, kind of hip, trendy vibe. And it's a place where I want to live. Um, it was a 1936 duplex, $430,000. And it needed a good amount of work. Um, the reason I felt comfortable with this property is, is location was right in front of a park. You just can't get that anymore in Dallas. And I know that's a pretty rare commodity to have. Um, and then the second thing is I knew that a lot of the renovations that would go into this is something I could personally do myself. Um, so part of the house hack pro process, excuse me, the house hacking process is kind of putting in your own sweat equity. So what I mean by that is like I can paint walls, I can re, you know, I can install some basic electrical things, I can fix it up on my own and not have to pay contractors. So I get a better rate on my return there. Um, so with the second property off of, off of Mission in, in Knox Henderson. Um, like I said, it was $430,000. I used the FHA loan. So my first primary home, you know, loan. So um, let, let me just stop yeah. there. Cause we have a ton of veterans that actually watch. And again, thank you guys for subscribing to my channel. We are both veterans. We've uh, been very fortunate with surrounding ourselves with, you know, for instance, such as Tyler with just a bunch of other hardworking veterans. 
But your instance, and I actually just made a video that's going to be out here shortly where I stated, hey, use your VA loan immediately. Like use your VA loan first. So give me an idea, and, and sorry to interrupt sure. you there, but give me an idea what made you want to use an FHA loan over your VA loan in that sense. Yeah, great question. So my VA loan, after working with Tyler and kind of talking through, you know, this is my plan. I want to keep doing real estate investing and going, going to this every single year. Um, my plan was to use the VA loan on a larger property. Um, while $430,000 property duplex in Dallas is a pretty large property, I was aiming for the next property to be an even bigger duplex, triplex, or quadplex. Even though they're very rare, maybe I could hit you know the lottery and actually find one of those. Um, and, and we'll talk about my most recent deal where I did use the VA home loan. But I used that on a much larger property that would have just been a little bit more difficult to have that initial cash up front if I wanted to do those renovations. Um, so that's why I pulled the trick on doing the FHA loan now when I knew I had the cash in hand. I didn't have any problems with funding and I could save that VA loan for a better property down the road. Yeah. So I actually, you know, I, I talk about it a lot in other videos. I tell people to fully leverage your VA loan. Unfortunately, I wasn't as educated when I was doing it myself. I bought my duplex for about $280,000. So I didn't fully leverage my VA loan the initial time. Then I used it again and went over my VA loan limit, which then had to bring cash to close. And it was a little unexpected at that time, not being educated. But in your sense, you said you fully utilized your VA loan for your next purchase. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and so just like building off of the first purchase, you know, with the FHA, it's still a fantastic tool for anybody that isn't a veteran. Um, of course, 3.5% down, I, I believe I closed for maybe $14,000 on a $430,000 duplex. Um, over the course of, you know, just focusing on that one property, um, about, uh, over the next year, maybe year and a half, I lived in that property the entire time, um, rented out my side, uh, once I left the property. But the, the big thing here is, is that I took my time focusing my own cash flow onto reinvesting it into that property. So the, the earnings I had from Mount Royal, the earnings that I had from my W2 job and by Mount Royal, that's your, oh, my, my first, first duplex. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, from my first duplex, the cash flow there, and then my W2 job, I would be funneling that into uh, the new Mission Avenue property. And I did that over the course of about a year, put about $70,000 of equity into the home. And that's just renovating what needs to be done, right? The kitchens, the bathrooms, making sure that the property is energy efficient and it's safe for, for future tenants. Um, and once I was pretty comfortable with that, and to clarify, one side was an Airbnb, so I also did furnishings there, and we could talk more about that. Um, and the other side was just a plan, long-term rental. Once I felt comfortable that that property was stable, that's when I re-entered the market to say, I'm ready to use my VA loan. So give me, give me a quick idea. You mentioned Airbnb for the folks that, you know, obviously his first rental, long-term rental, long-term tenants. Um, this was your second purchase. It was something that you occupied and you said you Airbnb'd mm -hmm. the other side. How'd that go? Uh, it went good. It's, it's a, it's a big learning experience because you jump into the hospitality market. Um, with Airbnb, it's, it's very, it's a very dynamic market. You, things are always shifting. Of course, we saw that over COVID when I lost, I can probably say, nine to 10 weeks of automatic bookings. Um, they just all dropped off. Luckily they got rebooked up, but with Airbnb, the story tell, the storytelling changes is when it, when it comes down to, I have to furnish the property. I have to make sure that people are comfortable in the property in, in the first place. Uh, people aren't partying in the property. So there's a lot of different rules set up. Uh, for me, I was still working a, a corporate job, working plenty, far too many hours each week. Um, so I went with active property, uh, active Airbnb managers, which are 15% a month, um, to go ahead and self-manage that whole entire thing. Okay. Um, and that is, they are setting up the cleaners. They're worried about like, let's say if there's any reimbursements, they're, they're changing up my calendar to be dynamic around prices and events that are occurring. Um, the journey was good. I would say over about a year and a half, I continued it as a short-term Airbnb. So that would be, I'm consistently getting bookings whenever they come in. This could be for the weekend. It could be for five days, two months, whatever that may be. Um, and I liked it. My, my calendar was consistently booked up. I averaged just over $4,000 a month in, in gross revenue, um, just on that one side of the duplex, uh, which wait, so you said, yeah. So his first rental he's pulling in, you said 2,300. Uh, 2,300 a month. Yeah. 2,300 total. And now you're pulling in over 4,000. Yeah. About 4,200 aside. 4,200 from Airbnb mm -hmm. on one side alone. Yep. That's right. That's incredible. That's yep. incredible. And, and it was, it was paying my mortgage, right? So I'm living for free at the same time, which only progresses my wealth growth. And now I can take more of my cash and put it into that property or save it for the next deal. So it was fantastic. So what, what happened next, I guess, in terms of your potential next investment? And if you invested again, what, what is going on with the other side of that duplex then? Yeah. So, so I, I went through a, a transition where, um, I 
and we'll talk about the the third purchase, uh, my my final duplex so far, um, where I moved out of my side of that duplex. Um, I've turned that into a long term rental because I didn't want to have two competing Airbnbs in the same neighborhood because it would actually pull business from one side. Um, and I didn't want to have it to become like, a, let's say a party house where people would strategically try to buy up both sides for a weekend and just a rager party. Um, so I built that one side to be just a long-term rental, very sturdy, very, very stable property. Um, it's currently renting right now for 22 to 50 a month, which is fantastic for that market. So overall, um, before I converted the Airbnb from short-term to long-term, which I can discuss, um, that would probably bring in about 63, 6,400 a month on average. Okay. Um, yeah. And what's, what's, what's your obviously second purchase FHA loan, you know, less down payment. You're talking three and a half on an FHA versus your first duplex you purchased, you know, as an investment property, 25% down low mortgage on that. What's your mortgage at, you know, with your, with your second investment? Uh, it is 2,800, I think 20, a little over 2,800. Okay. So if we round up, you know, close to 3000, you said you're pulling in how much now? Uh, just over 6,000 from that. Okay. So you're, you're over double your Mm -hmm. mortgage. Yep. Okay. And how's that roll into, or, or, or how did that help and develop you into purchasing your last duplex? Yeah, so so really that kind of gave me a little bit more leverage to say, well, I know I've, I've seen two different concepts, right? I've done a full-term, uh, long-term rentals, and now I've done the short-term addition with Airbnb, and I see that, that dynamic price change, but I still have a stable income to, to build off of. Um, with that, I want to change up my location again and find another hot market in the DFW area. And, and for me, I love Dallas. Um, so that's when I came to you and I said, Hey, I want a little bit higher rent duplex, um, triplex or quadplex if we can find one. Um, uh, but I went to look in West Dallas. I saw a lot, a lot of growth potential in Trinity Groves, Bishop Arts area, Oak Cliff. Um, and that's when we found the Bishop Arts one that, um, was 590 and is, uh, we, we closed on it at 590 and we got a whole bunch of extra things put in as far as repairs and things like that. Um, but close on it for 590, 0% down, of course, with the VA loan. So I came in only paying, I think maybe close to a grand in, in closing costs. Can't remember exactly. Um, and, and I, that's the one I currently live in now and I'm house hacking. Okay. So to get, give you guys some clarity here too, as he mentioned, he used his FHA loan on the second property for 430, correct? Didn't want to use his VA loan because he had the anticipation to fully leverage his VA loan. And you did just that. You're talking about a almost $600,000 duplex versus a $430,000 duplex that you purchased the second go round. And there's not really anywhere else that you can truly invest $1,000 and leverage 600 grand. I mean, that's that's the beauty of the VA loan. So go through go through that property. I know just from helping him purchase it, just like uh, the first property, it was another duplex that had kind of been fully remodeled to an to an extent. It was an older duplex, but torn down and, and rebuilt basically from you know the ground up. Correct? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I, I believe it's 1922 build um, and fully renovated in late 2018, early 19. Uh, sometime, and I believe I'm sure the flippers probably had some type of budget issues, but. Um, yeah, it, it, it was turnkey walking in. I, I probably spent maybe $5,000 and that's just to add shower doors and blinds. Um, just things that just need to be functional with the property. Uh, I've been living in that for about 10 months now, uh, very minimal expenses and it's only expenses to prolong the life of, of the property and to improve energy efficiency, things like that. Um, of course I'm living in this as well. So I'm trying to deck it out a little bit more to my needs as far as like, I want a more fun backyard and, and I want to, I want to express my budget to not only be this is a rental property, but this is currently my primary residence. I want to deck it out a little bit. Um, so, so the deal on that right now is, uh, I believe mortgage is 3,100. Um, and I haven't refinanced that yet. It will be refinanced once equity keeps growing. And of course we bought it at 590. Um, it looks like it's probably valued around 650 to 670 today. Um, Bishop arts is kind of a hot market, so it's continuing to, to, to boom up. Um, and my downstairs tenants are paying me 2,400 a month. Um, right now I have, uh, I do have a roommate. Um, sometimes we're working out agreements and he's going to be a future real estate investor, but, uh, I'll be rotating in new, more new roommates to help kind of offset that mortgage cost. So right now living in essentially what would be otherwise a, a brand new duplex, um, Granted, it's, you know, 1920s build, but it's been remodeled. Mm-hmm. You said downstairs is bringing in... 2400 2400 And how much would you say an average roommate's going to be spending there? I'd probably say 800 is Okay, so you're, you're talking 3200 and your mortgage is... thirty one. Okay, so as is just the duplex. And again, everyone that's watching this is obviously in a different market. We do have some subscribers locally in the Dallas-Fort Worth market. But he's essentially living and fully leveraging his VA loan, putting $1,000 down and living for free in one of the hottest areas in downtown Dallas. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And and I would say like that's only pro- progressing me to, to grow further, right? So like the last three years, I've pretty much been living for free. Well, of course, we know with real estate, there's four different forms of like growing your actual wealth, right? You have depreciation on property, depreciation for taxes, you have your cash flow, and then of course you have your equity growth. And my tenants are paying the equity growth. So it's unrealized as, as far as wealth generators for me. I don't feel it right now, but I know down the road when I retire, and if, if I want to sell the house or if I don't have a mortgage anymore, the cash flow is going to be ridiculous. Um, you know, each one of those is its own retirement fund on its own. So if it and and not to point at Dave Ramsey, but the snowball effect is now occurring, right? Where I can see one property is now helping me grow a second one faster and then a third faster and fourth and fifth. Um, so that's the plan. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I've discussed it before too. I think the biggest hurdle for a lot of people is, is that first property. Uh, you know, they're nervous to, you know, all of the overhead or the expenses or, you know, the initial down payment. Um, do you think that first property just getting in, you know, kind of your feet wet, did that help kind of roll you into the next? I mean, you did mention as as soon as we were about to close on that first property, you're ready for the second one, correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I can't remember. I must've been 24 or something like that when, when I closed on the first one. Um, so it was kind of strange, you know, buying house so young and, and of course, no, nobody else in, in our age group really does this. Um, I'm not saying we're, we're the 1%, but it's a very small portion of people in, at, at this age that are ready to jump into real estate investing. Um, it was a bit nerve wracking, especially with putting a larger down payment on that first one. The game plan would always just been house hack, right? That's a low down payment. You can get in for, you know, 14, 15,000 on, on a $430,000 duplex. Um, and that's a very expensive market. So it's it's not impossible to do this in any other market out there. Um, it's just you have to be okay with saying, I want to step outside the box. I want to be comfortable being a landlord. And so many people have this depiction of a landlord as a guy that is just always changing toilets, struggling, hating his life, getting midnight phone calls. Um, I can easily say, you know, I worked a corporate job for so many years and I had property managers. And I, I love that. It gives me an extra layer of like legal protection and they're getting the midnight phone calls. They're handling escalations. They're giving me my tax forms. You know, I'm getting, you know, reports from them. It's time that I want to save. Um, and that's kind of the whole goal with this is I'm, I'm aiming for financial independence, right? So I want my time back. I don't want to be stuck to doing a job forever. So I'd like my time back and property managers help me do that. Yeah. I think, I think a majority of the people that watch my channel and has kind of followed my journey from day one, uh, really are interested in doing the very same thing we've done as well as, you know, having that financial independence. I was able to leave my corporate job way sooner than I ever thought because of my real estate career kind of taking off. I heard that uh, you've kind of made a decision here recently. Give me uh, give me some insight on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people may know, but uh, yeah, I work, I work for a, a very large corporation for five years. Um, one that rewarded me very handsomely with, you know, of course, um, education, growth, you know, diversity to, to really push myself and learn more things. And of course, fantastic compensation. Um, and it's not something I took lightly, but um, about three weeks ago, I left that job um, after after five years. And I left it knowing that this was a job that could have provided me plenty of wealth in my life, but I wasn't ready to sacrifice 60 hour work weeks every single week for the rest of my life. Um, it was it was stressful, it was fast paced, but it was a good learning opportunity. But because of real estate, it's allowed me to do this transition to where now I can leave my my corporate job and pr- go pursue my passions, whatever that is, because I have steady cash flow now. Um, it's and it's predictable cash flow, and it's also helped me out because now three years into this journey of real estate investing, all of my savings for every single property is already capped out, right? So, like we talked about with the budgeting for vacancy, capex, repairs, I'm already at those those limits. I don't need to budget anymore for that. So that's just additional cash flow that's onto me. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty much allowed real estate investing has allowed me to kind of quit my job and, and go do what I want. I love that. I love that. I mean, that's, that's rewind four years ago, I guess five years ago when I, when I first technically got on bigger pockets and it was a good friend of mine, uh, back in high school that I really disconnected with, but then reconnected with, gosh, it was six or eight years, probably six, seven years after high school. And uh, I realized that he was doing pretty well in life in real estate, but I didn't understand. So he he threw out the uh, good old Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. Uh, so I went ahead and read my first book in 10 years. And then I also got told about Bigger Pockets, which you know we, we both know very much about. But at the end of the day, I was able to buy my duplex just, you know, just similar to, you know, you buying your three. I bought my duplex and then bought my single family, rented out the rooms in my single family house. And 
I was cash flowing on my duplex and I was not paying my mortgage on my single family. And unfortunately, as a high school teacher, there wasn't a ton of money for me to have to make up. So I left my corporate job way quicker than, you know, obviously you left your corporate job. But here we are, you know, sitting somewhere of 2020. I'm sure we'll be able to look back at this video and, and, and laugh in a sense because, you know, you having just left your corporate job, but it's, it's looking back myself, you know, three years ago when I left my corporate job, I could have never imagined, you know, being here today. So I'm excited to, to see what you're going to look back and see yourself. But to, to jump on to some other questions for you, because I know I personally have dealt, you know, with a, a handful myself and I personally... I've not gotten to the point where I've hired property management. Um, I'm at that point now. So yeah. anything moving forward, I definitely will. But in your sense, you're not dealing directly with tenants. Your property management company is dealing directly with tenants, correct? Yeah, that's correct. It, okay. And that even applies to the tenants that are actually living underneath me right now, my current duplex. Um, and it's not because I don't want to interact with tenants, but it's because there should be a sense of a layer between you and the actual tenant. And that could be for any specific reasons as far as like legal issues that could occur down the road or just you want to get bothered with with consistent complaints or issues. For example, like let's let's just say like my my tenant always went to come to me with a question or concern or a recommendation about the property. Hey, I think you should upgrade these lights. I think you should add a fireplace. I think you should do whatever. Right. Well, those are great suggestions, but I don't want to hear them all the time and feel free to escalate that to your property manager. Same thing with like requests, like the property management company can actually es escalate and expedite any type of repair needed much faster than I can, especially if I, let's say I'm traveling or enjoying my time or whatever that may be. Um, so I've found that as a very useful tool and it's, Yes, it's a cost, but it's a cost that I think is has been very valuable for me in this industry. So have you, I mean, in my case, it would be, be obviously handling it myself, but have you had your property management company reaching out to you saying, hey, this is an issue or that's an issue? Like what's what's your craziest tenant story? Do you have anything wild? Uh, I probably have a few wild things. Um, and are these are these going to be more Airbnb wild or are these going to be long term rentals? Uh, these are going to be more Airbnb wild. Okay, so caveat here, guys, don't buy Airbnbs. Just <laughs> yeah, I own one Airbnb. Obviously, if you watch my videos, it's in my own house, but it's just a bedroom and a bathroom. You own a full out, I could say, half duplex. It's a full right. house. So let's let's hear one. Yeah, um, I'll I'll give you the latest one uh, off the presses. So. Um, I actually switched up my Airbnb strategies to go from short term to long term. And what I mean by that is, is bookings over 30 days. Um, the reason why I did that is because I found that active management, of course, costing me 15% for property managers was a pretty high expense. But also at the same time, I have to pay the city of Dallas 7% for hotel occupancy tax. So right off the bat, I said, well, I don't want to have to pay 22 additional percent points on top of my revenue, right? Um, so I cut all that out and I'm only doing long term bookings now. Well, I started that back. So, in, yeah. so just quick question there. In terms of short term versus long term rentals, obviously every city is going to be different. But you said you have to pay seven percent tax to the city of Dallas. Yes. Is there a caveat there where if someone stays a certain amount of days, where you no longer have to pay that? What's yeah. the what's the stipulation? There? It, it's under thirty days. Okay. So, for example, if, if a normal Airbnb is operating and that's typically going to be booking up, you know, Thursday through Sunday kind of things. Um, any booking under 30 days is going to have to pay 7% hotel occupancy tax. I believe that's also on top of cleaning fees too, uh, which is a pretty large you know, percentage point of, of our overall revenue here. Um, so what I did is I sw I'm still actively operating on Airbnb, but the main thing here is now my bookings are only over 30 days. So for example, the last two, which uh, this is where this fun story comes from. Uh, the, the first guests I had, which they stayed for 76 days on my Airbnb, were two travel nurses here for, in town to help manage with COVID. Um, about a weekend and they, they seem like absolute sweethearts. Of course, they're, they're excited to enter the property. They get in, they love it. Um, the first weekend in, it's, it sounds like one of their boyfriends comes in town, um, gets intoxicated, um, goes out parties and somehow rips off the front gate in front of the actual door, um, completely rips it off. It's on the ground. The, apparently the cops were called because it was, you know, he was drunk and disorderly and screaming in the, in the streets and stuff like that. Um, it was quite a mess. And the, and what the problem here was, is this is my first time now saying, okay, it's a long-term Airbnb and I just cut out, I essentially just fired my Airbnb managers. So now this is on me to deal with. Um, and of course they were, they're very sweet with it. Um, but you know, of course 
middle of the night dealing with police officers. They don't know what to do. They're scared because they just damaged the property for the first time and they just moved in and they, you know, the travel nurses, they're, they're, they're there for work. Um, so I just work with them and, and, you know, we got a contractor out there within the next week. Um, <laughs> I think I'm assuming she probably broke up with that boyfriend. Not sure. Um, if you're out there, let us know. Uh, but, uh, it, it was, it was quite an interesting experience, but, um, we actually just did a transition, uh, a handoff from, from them. We had a day, day gap between that 76 day rental to a 60 day rental. Um, and that Airbnb just went through the property and it was, it was spotless. So they did a good job cleaning it up. Okay. So no issues in terms of getting them out or, or just kind of a, a rare no. occurrence in a sense. No eviction issues, nothing like okay. that. So it's been great so far. So on my side, uh, I have had, it was my initial duplex. My initial duplex has really been the only one that's given me issues. Um, I did have to evict one of the inherited tenants when I purchased it. So nothing like buying your first property and uh, living in it for five months, moving out, renting the side you moved out of, and then them realizing you don't live there anymore. So they stopped paying rent. So I had to evict uh, my inherited tenant of my duplex. And then not the initial tenant that I put into my side, but it was the second one that has since been there and probably going to be there forever. Um, which in a sense, you know, long-term rentals, if again, guys, if you can get someone for a long-term rental and get them there forever, it means less vacancy and they're likely going to make it their own. And they're also going to be less, you know, picky with things that necessarily need to be fixed because they do live there all the time. And then they also will, you know, they've asked me to paint, you know, walls or, you know, update this or update that because it's honestly their home at the end of the day. But this particular uh, tenant that's still in my property now, um, does not necessarily live the cleanest. Uh, so I did have to hire a pest control company to come out because my other side of my duplex was saying that there are German cockroaches in their uh, side of the duplex, which they were newer tenants at that time. And I had just replaced all the kitchen cabinetry and as well as the flooring in the living room. So it was a newly updated unit. So there's no reason why, unless they were just absolutely disgusting, right. why German cockroaches, which if you don't know what German cockroaches are, they are the worst cockroaches to get rid of. Um, so we went to the other side of the unit and lo and behold, we started opening up uh, some kitchen cabinetry and uh, found out where they were hanging out. So yeah. got a pest control company out to take care of that. It took us a very long time to get rid of them. Now, now I just pay a $50 expense every single month for my pest control company to yeah. basically uh, warranty that work because it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when that uh, is probably going to reoccur, but I've got a mm -hmm. pest control warranty on it. So not going to have to hopefully pay for that again because yeah. it was, I think, initially two or $3,000 just to get rid of the German cockroaches. Oh. So no updating, no, you know, built-in equity, you know, sweat equity, what we call here. No, yeah. it was just two or $3,000 because they are uh, not the cleanliest tenant. Oh, that sucks. So they're all, we're always going to have stuff like that, though, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being landlords as well. Um it's, it's part of the game. Yeah. So absolutely. what's, what's your, uh, what's your next move? Uh, well, like I said, uh, I just left my job a few weeks ago. So right now I am studying to become a, a investment advisor and launch my own firm. Um, luckily I've had a lot of, um, friendship and mentors in this industry, uh, of course, tailoring into just this real estate journey. Um, my sponsor for my actual certification is, is a good friend of Tyler and a, uh, another business partner of him. Um, so a lot of my journey and, and where I'm going is because I actually started off from bigger pockets talking to you. Right. Um, so, so my next step is going to be launching my own investment firm. I really want to help people get educated about real estate investing, about, you know, investing in retirement accounts, budgeting, understanding how to get out of, let's say the rat race is what you know Robert Kiyosaki in that group calls it uh, but to to eventually move past debt and start growing actual wealth um, I think that there's a pretty large gap in our overall education system just regarding financial education um, you know for for guys like you and I we probably read it from rich dad poor dad and some other simple books that kind of sparked the interest but you don't really feel that in modern day education I went to college for, for a business degree I got that business degree and I can tell you I can run business operations well, but nobody ever taught me how to run my own personal operations well. Um, so I find that as a, as a severe gap out there and I want to start working on, on that with individuals. Sweet. So I know personally what it's like to quit my corporate job and what it takes to be able to buy a property, kind of the, let's say tax, uh, holdbacks, I guess you could say. And I've also gone over this with him himself. Um, but give people kind of a, a heads up. If you are looking to quit, you know, what we call the rat race and get out of your corporate job, 
we do want to give you guys some advice that what, what in order, in, especially in your case, like if you wanted to purchase another property and I went through the same process myself, having quit teaching and then gotten into real estate itself and being a real estate agent. But if you wanted to purchase another property right now, what, what's, what's going to have to happen? Well, it, it really just depends. And, and that's where it comes in, like working with you and Tyler, these guys that are, that, you know, you're already doing it nonstop. Um, what I would probably be looking at is either developing a trust or, or having a separate entity just set up to essentially just acquire rental properties. Uh, it's not a difficult process, but at the same time, there are so many different strategies that go into that. For example, like a syndication, right? Pulling a whole bunch of different investors together to acquire large property, whether that's apartment complex, senior assisted living facility, a quadplex, whatever that may be, um, or just buying single family homes. And, and you're looking for investors that come in and help pay for that down payment or pay for the renovation costs. And then you work through you know, the Burr strategy, which is commonly discussed on bigger pockets, uh, refinance, pay the investors back, and then now you have a cash flowing asset. Um, so that's probably what I'm going to be looking at doing uh, right now. Right now, the main focus will be getting the, the first business up and going and sprinting. Uh, and then the second second operation will be that exact same thing is, is now I won't have a W-2 job. So what can I fall back on to keep buying properties? So do you think the current duplex that you're in, is that going to be home for a bit? Uh, I do. And I, I, I think so. Cause I'm going to be selfish with it. I love the location. Um, I love Bishop arts. It, it feels like a family neighborhood to me. Um, you know, I, I'm enjoying my time here and I, I kind of use that as my, that's my office. That's my incubator. That's where I get a lot of work done. Um, but it won't be my forever home and I'm completely fine with that. But also the beauty of this whole journey is I'm going to keep buying properties for the rest of my life. I'm going to keep buying them in, in different States, different locations. I'm going to try to be tactical with it. Let's know he's, him. he's going to always use me. Oh, always agent. use him. Yeah. Or, or his referrals out of state. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, but, but the main focus is, is like, I'm going to keep doing this. And if I want to go back and live in, let's say in Bishop arts again, and this is in 20 years, I can do that because it's my property. I just wait for it at least to end up. And then I go in. Um, so I'm going to be selfish with this one. Um, you know, I've done, I've done three large duplexes. I think total value or equity worth it is about 1.45 million right now. Um, in, in three years, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, but I want to keep progressing forward. Um, doesn't mean I have to sprint. So like, I want to, I want to focus on buying the right properties at the right time during the right market cycle. Um, of course it just depends. And, and of course using the right agents to help track them down. Uh, but, uh, I, I probably, I'm, my goal right now is I'm, I'm 28. I just turned 28, but by the time I'm 31, I have seven total duplexes. Um, so 14 units and I'm working on an ADU right now. So I'm going to try to get that goal up to 15. Uh, so it's just another small strategy that I have, but I want to keep progressing in that cycle. I do think it is the strongest form of wealth, you know, growth. Um, and that's coming from me as a guy that's going to be an investment advisor. Perfect. Perfect. So one other thing here with, with regard to you and your success. Okay, what would you, if you could go back and change anything, would there be anything that you would change or do differently? Oh, uh, I would probably, I wish I would have picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was like 16, 17, 18. Yeah, and uh, also another thing here too, guys, regardless of what your age is, you know, I don't honestly know what a majority of the folks that are subscribed to my channel are in terms of their age. I started real estate at the age of, I, be, I guess I picked up uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad at 26, 27. Um, started, I think I fir purchased my first property at 27. You said you purchased yours at 24? 24, yeah. Yeah, so I mean... He was three years ahead of me. Technically, you're what, 20, 28. 28 right now. I had one property at that time, and you have three duplexes. Everyone's path in this journey is going to be different. You could be 35, 40, 45, you know, single, married, couple, regardless what your situation is. The biggest issue, as I mentioned earlier, is people just don't get started, right? And the level of sacrifice, I think, is something that keeps people from wanting to take that jump. Right. And in a sense, your first property wasn't necessarily a sacrifice because you weren't living in it. But everyone's going to have to sacrifice if you're going to want to purchase and live in specifically, you know, investment opportunities like my duplex I lived in and I rented out the other side. And I also rented out my roommates or my rooms for roommates. You rented out your side. You know, you rented out the other side of your duplex. You have a roommate now. There's going to be some level of sacrifice. I think at the end of the day, your level of success or how much you bring back is going to be truly dependent on the amount that you do sacrifice. Yeah. But in terms of uh, going back, you just wish that you would have, uh, you know, picked up that book just a little bit earlier. Yeah, I, w I wish I would have. Because, of course, growing up, we, th we think there's so many different norms that, that tell us how to become rich and wealthy, right? They tell us, hey, put your money in a savings account. Well, there's no... You're not going to make any interest in a savings account. Um, go buy a go buy a home. That's going to be your best wealth generator, right? And that's what all of our parents are saying. Like, hey, 
I have a, I have this nice home. This is, you know, this is where a whole bunch of our wealth is. Well, a home that you are personally paying your own money into every single year for 30 years of the life of that mortgage, that's a liability. You know, at the same time, like you are the one that's funding that mortgage. You're paying for the interest. You're paying for the maintenance, the repairs, the CapEx, everything like that. That's, that's a, that's a liability. And that's really what Rich Dad, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad taught me. That kind of opened my eyes to say, oh crap, I didn't, I didn't know that that was an actual liability. How do I find assets? Um, and then started focusing on, well, like in Rich Dad Poor Dad, of course, that if I could read this at age 18, that'd be great. But start identifying what passive streams of income look like. Start investing into streams of income. Um, I think that would be, that would be a big, big ticket for me. And I think something else that we probably both got that the, you know, the average individual won't is we're both in the Marines and that, whether that's any, any branch of service, um, I think no, that, it's just Marines, just Marines. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's just Marines. I, I think they do a great job teaching discipline to young men and women super early on in their lives. Um, and it's just with that, it kind of brings you into the next step of, of your career, whether that's continuing in the military or, or doing whatever. Um, but it brings discipline to a sense that like, I'm now focused on what my goals are. I want to continue to, to focus on my passions. I'm not gonna let anything get in my way and I'm going to stay dip, disciplined to, you know, who I am and, and my beliefs. Um, for me, I think that that was, that was something that really helped me kind of grow, especially as I went through college, I started my corporate career. And then I learned about real estate investing as I said, okay, this is a journey that makes sense. I understand the numbers. Let's follow it. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to back out or keep pandering and getting into the market and, and, you know, working with an agent for a few weeks and then pulling back out because I'm scared about it. It's time to just jump in. And because I jumped in, I'm now able to escape the corporate structure, the W2 nine to five and, uh, and do what I want. Yeah, and I'm going to give a, a quick shout out here just to let's see if he actually watches this entire video to the end. But just to give you guys an example, I mean, there's really no there's never going to be it's too early or I'm too young. Just to give you guys an example, I used to be, again, a high school teacher in San Antonio, Texas. I had uh, a good athlete at the time. His name was Alex Saylor. He also follows me on Instagram and watches my YouTube videos. He has since obviously aged four years, four or five years since I was teaching in San Antonio, but he was a wrestler at the school. At the time, I really had no knowledge and understanding of real estate at all. I mean, I remember it may have been him or someone else on the team giving me crap because me as a coach was sitting in the bleachers reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I mean, that's where, honestly, at a wrestling tournament on a Saturday, that's where it all began. And now fast forward, you know, the five years it has been, he's obviously, obviously graduated high school. He just got commissioned, I believe, uh, in the Air Force. He's going to be stationed out in California. He has read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, in college and, and wanted to, he's followed me on Instagram and wanted to kind of do what I've been able to do. And he's already asking me or has asked me recently about, you know, potentially purchasing some kind of property, you know, at the age of 22, just fresh out of college. Yeah. So... On the flip side, I think our society kind of pushes us to have that, you know, white picket fence. You know, hey, my first house that I have, I need to love. It needs to be something I'm going to call home for the rest of my life. I was never going to call a duplex in a, in a lower income area of our metroplex home. But I called it home for five months and then moved out. But we get pushed so much like, hey, this is the life we need to live. Uh, when in reality, I think it's, it's the, you know, different people that are that are succeeding a little bit more than you know what society pushes on us because you know we're sacrificing at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, and I would absolutely agree. Like you said, with the white picket pick, picket fences, that's that's part of this whole strategy of keeping up with the Joneses. I got to be better than my neighbor. I got to keep focusing on buying more liabilities. I have to have the nicest car. I have to have the nicer house, and that kind of keeps cutting out of that cash flow, cutting out of your actual wealth, right? And you won't have the opportunity to keep jumping into real estate if you keep focusing on, well, am I, is my appearance better than somebody else's? Um, but what I will say is the amount of focus and effort that comes from, you know, being in real estate, it, there's a, you need to be actively involved. Like this isn't something that's just going to, you're, you're going to set in, forget it kind of thing. You always need to be kind of keeping up with the property and the health of the property, whether you have property managers or not. Um, but I can say, if, and most people probably watching this video are either interested in real estate investing or have already done it, the best thing that you can possibly do is continue to share this information. It's free. Talk to any one of us about it. We'd love to talk more, but there's books online. There's podcasts that you can watch for free. Like this is, this is such a new way of growing wealth that previously people just thought, you know, okay, just some old guy in a corner is a landlord and he's grumpy all the time, right? Well, I'm, I'm 28 and I'm a landlord and I'm not grumpy. I'm, I'm happy, right? This is giving me opportunity. Um, but the best thing you can do is honestly share this content, you know, like discuss this with your friends, your peers, your neighbors, your parents. Um, I've had the ability to, to have these conversations and in the last two, 
two years, I think I have three people that have gone to you and are now buying or have already bought duplexes. And I have plenty more coming down that pipeline because they're preparing their wealth. Um, they see what these success stories look like. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned earlier about the current duplex he's living in right now, I'm actually in the works to help your roommate out now, which did he have any knowledge about any of this stuff before meeting you or where, where did all that come from, from him? Uh, yeah, I, I think, I think he knew it was out there. Um, but, uh, it, it really came down to us sitting down and, and, you know, living together and explaining what these numbers look like. Um, and, and shout out to, to Johnson. Um, he's been a great friend and an ally to me, but he's been there with me on this journey over the last 10 months. So he's seeing the active management that goes into a current property. He's been to my other properties. He's actually helped me work on the Airbnb at my last property. Um, we go through these numbers together. I've, I've taught him the ex exact equations and the way to analyze a good rental versus a not good rental. Um, and now he's in the market. He's hunting these things down. He's excited and he's showing me his spreadsheets and he's saying, does this work? Does this not work? And now he's getting the, the, the understanding to say, yeah, I'm ready to go. I, f I feel like this is a good property. Let's make an offer. Go into you and say, Hey, pull the trigger. Of course it's a, tough market right now. Um, but it, it's something that I, I don't believe that he would have just picked up on his own. Nothing against you, Johnson. Uh, but the fact that it is, we just had that incubator. Um, and we have a few other people too, that are outside of the state of Texas and that couldn't use you, but are also already moving into their first duplexes because of these conversations. Yeah. And it, it all goes back to surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. I think I just let a video out. I think it was two videos ago. One of the, the biggest things that I've learned from owning my own business, not being a business professional, was uh, you know truly surrounding yourself with great people, other like-minded individuals that are going to push you to constantly be better. So just to wrap things up here, give uh, one or two tidbits of, of advice for anyone, whether or not they're you know a complete newbie or if they're an experienced investor you know, they've been doing this for a decade or two, like what would your best advice, you know, moving forward for people out there watching? Yeah, I would say if, if you're an experienced investor, whether that is, you know, you have one single family rental or multiple, you know, quadplexes, whatever that may be, share your content, like sh share your information, talk to other people about it, be okay, not in a sense of like, I'm trying to brag, but share your wealth because you know for a fact that this form of wealth creation works. Um, so then it'd be, I mean, if you have that ability, please, discuss it with your friends and your families. If, they, if they're welcome to it, that's great. If they're not, that's great as well. But you need to do your best to help it kind of grow the wealth for anybody out there. If you're a newbie, don't be afraid to ask questions. That is the most important thing that you can actually do is say, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I'll hop on the bigger pockets for him and ask some questions. Hey, I'm new to the area. I don't know where to invest. I don't know what a good market is. Is this a good time to buy? What do you think about single family versus multifamily? Because there's so many different ways to invest in real estate. Um, you know, I have newbies asking me about, and sorry if you're a newbie, but, uh, you know, should I go with a REIT, you know, is a REIT a better option for me to invest in real estate or should I put money into paying into my parents mortgage, right? All different strategies are out there. Not all of them are great and not all of them make sense for the stage in your life. But if you're new to this, you have to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to stand up and say, I don't understand something or, or call up somebody, including myself, if you, even if you never met me, but ask the question to say, Hey, where should I get started? Who should I talk to? What should I read? Um, if you stay quiet, you're never going to get in, you know into this game. And if you don't get into this game, it's going to it's not going to set you back significantly, um, but it, it can hurt your chances of becoming a, a retiring a hell of a lot earlier. I'll say that. Yeah, I agree. So I appreciate uh, having you on the channel and here for the interview today. Hopefully I'll uh, be able to bring some more folks out for uh, more content like this. If you guys do have any questions, whether it be for me or Denver specifically, leave them down in the comment section below. Make sure to like and subscribe. I'll also leave Denver's Instagram. Is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, yeah. you can hit me up on Instagram anytime. Okay, so I'll leave his Instagram link down in the bio as well. Again, make sure to let me know if this kind of content, kind of an interview style, sense is something you guys want to see more of. I'm obviously helping people not just locally, but across the country. I'd love to uh, continue to do content for you guys. And as he mentioned, make sure to get your content out. I think that's the premise entirely from what my YouTube channel is about. I'm not here to make a ton of money. I'm not here to make a living on YouTube. I'm here to get all of the information I've learned out to other people because I feel just like you that it wasn't content that was available for me or at least that I was looking for or seeking out. So I'm going to do my best by continuing to upload content for you guys on my YouTube channel so I can further educate you guys as much as I can. <sighs> Woo!
did that in one take. Yeah, that was pretty good, dude.